Yeah, so uh, there's a, a bit of an ambitious agenda today because, uh, first of all, I've made the talk for a, sort of a, suited for a general scientific audience. So um, I see a number of experts. Uh, hopefully, you'll be, uh, you'll be entertained by my burgeoning MATLAB skills, uh, even if you know all of the material. Um, and then I also want to give uh, an impression uh, of sort of the breadth uh, and the flavor and intensity of work that's gone on at the Institute uh, over the semester, as well, of course, as uh, justifying the title of the talk as the unreasonable effectiveness of spectral graph theory. Okay, so towards that end, here's the brief agenda. Uh, the talk's gonna have three parts. The first part will be the reasonable effectiveness of spectral graph theory. It will be uh, about some beautiful classical things and it, it will serve as an introduction for those of you who, who don't know much about, about the subject. Uh, of course, then we'll move on to the unreasonable effectiveness, and we'll see some things that uh, uh, are true but, but shouldn't be, okay? And, uh, and then the last part of the talk will, uh, will, will concern uh, using spectral graph theory to, uh, uh, to confront issues in complexity theory, like things like uh, P versus NP, uh, and the Unigand conjecture, and, and uh, which will uh, will be introduced to in the third part. Okay, so this is the agenda. Um, you need a very small mathematics and physics background for the talk, so let me go through the background now. Okay, so here's what you need from the mathematics. You just need to know that real symmetric matrices have real eigenvalues and uh, eigenvectors, okay? So just to belabor the point, let's write down a, a symmetric matrix. Okay, this is real because it has, you know, the entries are real numbers. It's symmetric about the diagonal, that looks good. Uh, okay, so then the claim is that it has real eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and in fact, here are the three eigenvalues. I've written them in finite precision. These two are roots of some quadratic equation, it doesn't matter. And here are some corresponding eigenvectors, okay? And uh, right, this is just so that everybody is, is on the same page. And so that we establish some trust, let me, uh, let's confirm that one of these is an eigenvector. I'll just choose one at random. Okay, let's take this one. Uh, <laughs> All right, so you guys can all do the multiplication with me. This is one, okay. Well, that's, that's, this is zero. Okay, and this is minus one, all right. So indeed, one, minus one, zero, one is an eigenvector with eigenvalue minus one, okay? And in general, if we have a symmetric matrix of real entries, we'll always be able to find such real eigenvectors and uh, real eigenvalues and associated eigenvectors, okay. That's the math background you need. Now for the physics background, which is somewhat less uh, um, restrictive, you just need to have the intuition that, if you, that you shouldn't touch the end of this metal thing because it's hot and, uh, and heat tends to, uh, uh, tends to go from hot things into things which are less hot, okay. All right, so that brings us to our, now, now we've, that, those are the preliminaries. That brings us to, uh, uh, okay, so uh, sort of the more mathematical aspect of the talk. Okay, so here is a, is a cold, this is a torus or a donut, okay? At the moment it's cold, except that we put a little bit of heat at this spot. Uh, and then if we allow uh, sort of the heat to diffuse in the, in the torus, it sort of looks like you might expect. It's actually very satisfying. It makes you feel warm inside. Uh, so the, 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 uh, the heat disperses until it becomes uniform in the body, okay? So there's a, there's a picture. And uh, if we had a somewhat sadder torus, so this is a sadder donut, which is, which is a sort of long and skinny. Um, well, you should think about right now what will happen if we, uh, if we allow the, if we, if we again put a little bit of heat there and then allow it to evolve for a bit. You can think about sort of whether it should, you know, whether the heat should spread out faster or slower than in the, in the fat torus. Probably people have some intuition. And indeed, your intuition is correct that uh, it starts to spread out, but then it gets a little bit trapped here. It will, get, it will go to equilibrium eventually, but uh, it got trapped for a while because just, I mean, if we took the cross section, right, then the, the cross section of this torus is very thin and it traps heat on one side of the torus for a while. Okay, still we get to equilibrium, but it took us longer. This will be an important uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, phenomenon in the talk, but the talk is about computation. So instead of, uh, and it's, it's gonna be about discrete objects. So instead of having this uh, continuous heat flow, we're gonna talk about uh, a discrete version of the heat flow. Uh, so here's a graph. A graph is a bunch of vertices, which are the yellow dots connected by edges. Um, uh, and, uh, and now we're gonna define a, sort of a discrete version of this, uh, uh, of, of sort of the way the heat flows, but 
now in this graph. Okay, so, so just look at a single vertex, and, and here are its five neighbors. Okay, this is just, I've re repeated this over here. And maybe there is some initial configuration of heat at this vertex and its neighbors. So the middle vertex has lots of heat, the surrounding neighbors have somewhat less heat. Uh, and so we expect that if we allow the heat to uh, you know, evolve for a few moments, then uh, since, since the vertices are exchanging heat, say, along the edges, you know, uh, the vertex in the middle here will have somewhat less heat after, say, one step of this discrete time process. We're going to define it formally in a second. This is just for intuition. And uh, I don't know what happens at these vertices because, of course, uh, we didn't draw, I mean, this vertex has other neighbors in the graph from with which it's exchanging heat, so I didn't draw what happens there. But at this vertex, we expect that the heat would go down because it has relatively more than its neighbors have. Um, and uh, one important point I should make is that, okay, this, this vertex has five neighbors. That's called the degree of the vertex. And uh, for the rest of the talk, uh, whenever we see a graph, all of the vertices will have the same degree. So this, the degree will not matter, but every vertex will have the same degree, and that's just making, so it makes it easier for us to normalize things. That's not material. So it's just a technical thing which you can remove in every, everything I'll discuss. Okay. Um, okay, so now I want to define formally what was this process that took us from one configuration to another. Um, so to do that, we need to give the vertices names. They're not very clever names, but uh, we'll name them uh, 1 up to n. And, uh, and then we can describe a configuration of heat as just a vector, right? So the ith vertex has uh, an amount of heat which is u sub i. So this is just a vector in Rn. Uh, and then we need some way to operate on this vector. Okay? So this is going to be the discrete analog of the heat flow. So it's going to be, uh, you'll see in a minute why it's called the random walk matrix. It's a real symmetric n by n matrix. Um, on the diagonals, we'll put one half down the diagonal. And then uh, for the off diagonal entries, if ij is an edge, so if i and j are connected by an edge in this graph, we'll put one over 2d, and otherwise we put zero. Okay? And the important thing about this operator is that if we apply it to some configuration of heat u, and then we look at the ith coordinate, so this is the amount of heat that's on vertex i after we evolve by one step of the heat flow. Then it's an average. It's an average of what the, the amount of heat that was there before, which is ui. And so it's half of that plus half of the average of the neighbors. Okay? And the important thing here is this, it's in green, is the average of the neighbors. These factors, one half, are not so important. It's just a parameterization of time. If you wanted time to go more slowly, you could make this one 0.99, and you could make this one 0.01. And do, uh, so this is, these are not so important. Okay? But this is, the, yeah, so this, this is what we mean by the sort of discrete uh, time heat flow. So we apply, we multiply by this matrix, we go from one configuration to another. All right, so here's a, I mean, this graph was very simple. Let's, now here's a more complicated graph, okay? So what's going on in this complicated graph? Um, well, uh, I've, I've, I've heated up this one vertex here at the bottom, and then we'll see what happens when, uh, when we allow heat to diffuse from this, uh, from this vertex into the rest of the graph. So okay, the graph is spinning. Try not to be alarmed by that. Uh, it's just so you can see all the vertices. But you'll notice that as it spins, actually, there is heat going into the graph. Some vertices are getting more red than others. Um, the, the, the points in space, that how we've embedded the vertices into R3 here, uh, is, is uh, basically completely at random. And that there's a point to that, which is that if I, if I gave you this graph uh, uh, and I didn't tell you anything about it, you know, then you know, somehow you're just given vertices and lists of edges. So, okay, so maybe it just looks like this complicated object to you. Right? There's no, at the moment, you know, sort of a priori, you don't have any nice way of thinking about this graph. Okay, so here we let the heat evolve for a little bit, and you'll notice that uh, some of the vertices are sort of very warm and comfortable, uh, but then there are lots of vertices that didn't get much heat. Okay? And, uh, and if you were left to explain this phenomenon just from this graph, it, I mean, okay, it looks difficult at least to explain what's going on here. This graph, by the way, is only on um, 200 nodes. Uh, so if you had a graph on a million nodes or 100 million nodes, you can think that things would be even more complicated. Um, okay, but that's where the sort of the spectral part of things come in. So why was it complicated to understand what happened in this graph? Well, it's because if we start with some initial configuration of heat, and then we apply this uh, walk operator one time, this is, the, this is sort of the resulting vector. And if we apply it again, then uh, you know, this vector has a sum over passive length 1, this vector actually has sums over passive length 2, and if we applied it k times, we would get sums over all the paths of length k between a vertex and all, and sort of all the things that can be reached by passive length k. And obviously, this is getting very complicated. So if you try to understand what's going on here from looking at this representation, I mean, um, good luck. Right? Uh, 
Okay, but of course, since we're applying the same operator over and over again, uh, it makes sense to diagonalize it. Makes, okay, so let's, let's put it in the spectral basis, okay? So uh, remember this W is real and symmetric, so it uh, has eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Let's call the eigenvalues mu1 up to mu n, and the eigenvalues v1 up to vn, okay? And um, good. So now, with a little bit of upfront work, first we write this initial configuration u uh, in the eigenbasis. So now it's a linear combination of the eigenvectors. Uh, and, but now things are really nice, right? Now if we want to apply this w, all that happens here is we just multiply by the corresponding eigenvalues. That's how you evolve. And if you want to apply w again, we just multiply again by the eigenvalues. And you know, now it's very little effort to do this over and over. So if we want to compute the kth power for some general k, again, the representation is just uh, we take the representation of u and multiply by the corresponding eigenvalues. All right. So of course, this is the whole point of, I mean, this is, this is why, you know, uh, why diagonalizing matrices is really nice. Uh, but we can actually read off a lot about what's going on here in this heat flow uh, from this expression. So if we, if we arrange so that the eigenvalues are decreasing, okay, then let me tell you uh, sort of what's going on here. The top eigenvalue is, is one, okay? And it corresponds to the, the sort of the uniform distribution. It corresponds to a vector that's the same in all the coordinates. And this represents the fact that if we're at equilibrium and we, and we operate by this W, then we stay at equilibrium, okay? So the equilibrium has uh, eigenvalue one, doesn't change. Um, and if the graph is connected, then uh, all of the rest, actually, the way we've defined the graph, all the eigenvalues are uh, actually non-negative. And, uh, and uh, if, the, if the graph is connected, then um, all of these, the rest of the eigenvalues are strictly less than one, okay? So, what you can, so you can see that what happens sort of as you evolve here is that, uh, well, the first eigenvalue is one, so sort of this column just stays the same. And the, the rest of the eigenvalues are strictly less than one. So, so these, this entire part is decaying as we increase k, as we increase the time to infinity, okay? And this just represents the fact that uh, if the graph is connected, then eventually we converge to equilibrium, where the heat is uniformly distributed, right? Um, uh, and now you can say, okay, well, we saw, for instance, these two different tori at the beginning. One of, sort of, one of them converged to equilibrium somewhat faster than the other. Uh, from here, you can also read off how fast things are converging to equilibrium. Uh, why? Okay, so I mean, you know, I mean, if all of these numbers, we said they're less than one, everything that's not mu1, mu2 up to mu1, if they were all much less than one, then of course these terms would decay very fast and you'd get to equilibrium at a very high speed. But let's just look at the sort of the one that's closest to one but not equal to one. You know, if this, if this one is very close to one, then actually this mode will decay slowly under the operation of the uh, of the, of the discrete heat flow. And so it will take a long time for any contributions from this eigenvector uh, to be pushed to zero, okay? And it turns out that if you, if you care about sort of the, the first order asymptotics of how this heat spreads out, then this uh, V2 and mu2 are very important, okay? So let's just see a, a picture of that, right? So this was our complicated picture before where we let the heat flow for a long time and you know, some, some vertices appear to be doing well, others are, are having a hard time but it's not clear why from this embedding. So what I'll do is I'll take the second eigenvector, okay, the one which I said controls sort of the first order uh, asymptotics of how the heat spreads out, and we'll just, uh, in, this, in this coordinate, we'll map all the vertices according to their value in this, uh, in this eigenvector. Okay, so here you can see what happens. Very nice, all right. Uh, and now you say, ah, this is why the heat got trapped. I mean, everything got trapped on, on this side because some jerk, which is, I guess, I guess me, you know, made these guys really well connected and these really well connected, and in the, in the middle, things are somewhat more sparse. But the point is that the, the spectral data reveals this to you, whereas when, it, when you were just confronted with the graph, you, you wouldn't have been able to see this very well. Um, okay, so... The main point here is that, I mean, how did I design this, this graph, so that this, this would happen? I took a bunch of vertices uh, and, and uh, split them into two sets. Inside, I sampled with some large probability, and between the two sets, I sampled with some small probability, right? Uh, thereby creating this bottleneck that sort of like heat has a hard time to flow between these two sets because uh, basically the density here is much higher than the density in between. Okay? And in general, you can think about these bottlenecks as objects you know, to study for their own, right? So if I have a graph and I take a set of vertices in the graph, um, uh, one can define this phi. So this is the expansion of the set. 
which is trying to get at how much of a bottleneck this set is. Okay, so phi is the ratio of the number of edges crossing the cut. So these blue edges in this picture are the ones that cross the set S divided by the volume of S. That's the expansion of phi. This is, a, you can, this is the surface area. This is sort of the ratio of the surface area to the volume of S. Uh, and intuitively, you might expect that uh, if I have a set for which this is small, then heat might get trapped in this set because, because the surface area compared to the volume is, is not very large. Uh, and you can define for a graph sort of the, you know, the optimal, let's try to find the, the worst bottleneck. So that's this phi star of G, okay? So we go over all sets. I mean, uh, if you look at it, the, there's, there's always sort of the set and also its complement set. So that's why we restrict to B size at most half. So we're only considering the smaller side of the, of the two. Uh, so phi star of G represents the smallest bottleneck in the graph G. So this is a, a natural thing. I mean, computationally, you should think that uh, there are many reasons we might like to study bottlenecks. Um, uh, one reason is, I mean, you know, bottlenecks are bad in a communication network, but also bottlenecks are very good for many other things. I mean, if your graph is a social network and the edges represent friendships, then uh, bottlenecks correspond basically to communities, to, to groups of people who communicate more internally than they do externally. And uh, even perhaps more fundamentally in computer science, you know, when you're presented with some massive input, uh, one of the best things you can do algorithmically is divide and conquer. You break the input into two pieces, you solve some problem on each piece, and then you combine those solutions back together. Uh, and if you want to employ some divide and conquer algorithm, then these bottlenecks are really great because it means that uh, I can split my uh, input into two pieces. Uh, which are both substantial, so I sort of substantially reduce the size of the problem I'm thinking about, but also I'm reducing the interaction between the two pieces so that when I want to do the conquer step, and, and uh, wait, that's not how conquering works. When I want to, okay, at the end, once we've solved the two subproblems and we want to put them back together, sort of the fact that the interaction between the two sides is small means that we don't have to do so much work to put them back together, right? They were somewhat independent subproblems, okay? So this actually turns out to be, I would say, uh, in the modern theory of algorithms, one of the most important concepts we have, if not the most uh, sort of important concept, this notion of expansion. Okay, and uh, now I'll tell you sort of the, the most basic uh, theorem of, uh, of uh, at least this style of spectral graph theory. Uh, okay, one second, don't, don't look at that yet. Um, which uh, is gonna tell us something about when these bottlenecks exist and uh, sort of what role they play. Okay, before I do that, I need to tell you that you know, my favorite matrix is not this walk matrix W. It's actually the Laplacian, the corresponding Laplacian matrix. So the Laplacian is I minus W, okay? Uh, this doesn't do anything, okay? The eigenvectors stay the same. And the eigenvalues essentially stay the same, except now that we just, you know, every eigenvalue goes from being uh, whatever it was to one minus whatever it was. I just like this parameterization better because uh, when you do it this way, you can think about the eigenvalues as energies of some sort. So now the, the equilibrium state, the uniform distribution, has eigenvalue zero, and uh, sort of this, this uh, bottleneck eigenvector, with the one that, was, that I said was controlling how fast uh, heat mixes, or how fast heat converges to equilibrium in a graph, uh, that's sort of the, the, the lowest non-trivial energy state, sort of the lowest non-trivial mode of vibration of the graph. Nothing matters here except that for the rest of the talk, I'm going to deal with these things because I like this parameterization better. Okay, so nothing changed except that we reversed the order of the eigenvalues and okay, subtracted them from one. But here's now something which is uh, not so hard to prove but very powerful. It's the discrete Cheeger inequality, which says in words that the major obstructions to the heat uh, converging to equilibrium fast are these bottlenecks. Okay, so we said that the you know, sort of the, the, the smallest non-trivial eigenvalue uh, controls at the first order how fast this, uh, the heat flow converges. And this discrete Cheeger inequality tells you that, you know, this second eigenvalue is small, is close to zero, if and only if there's a bottleneck in the graph, okay? It's in a quantitative sense, right? I mean, okay, what I said is qualitative. You see quantitatively what happens. If lambda two is small, of course, it means this quantity is small. And if this quantity is small, it means this quantity is small. And you should, of course, there's like a, you know, you can, you, can, uh, you can remake the world however you like, you know, in the space between, between this uh, power one and this power one half. So there's actually an, a ton of stuff going on there. But at least qualitatively, that's what the discrete Shigeru inequality says, that uh, 
that the only obstructions to, uh, to this heat conversion to equilibrium, uh, at least sort of major obstructions, are bottlenecks. And, the, and the, the nice thing is that I told you that for many reasons we care about actually being able to compute these bottlenecks. Uh, so this tells us that uh, sort of this spectral algorithm that we use to, to sort of find the, the bottleneck cut uh, in this graph actually works in general. Okay? So uh, if you want to find the bottleneck cut and you know that one exists, then you can use the second eigenvector to find it. Okay? Just by an analog of what we did uh, to compute this embedding. You just arrange things according to the the, the eigenvector corresponding to lambda two, lambda 2, and it tells you uh, where this bottleneck cut is. Okay, and the algorithm is actually very, very fast and very simple. Okay, so that's the, that sort of concludes the reasonable effectiveness of spectral graph theory. This is the classical theory. It's very nice. You know, you understand, uh, you know, how you can get control on these bottleneck cuts, which as I, I, I claimed are very important computationally, uh, using part of the spectrum. That's the reasonable part. So now we go on to the, okay, the unreasonable part. So it's sort of uh, things that happen that uh, you wouldn't have expected earlier. Okay, so, uh, all right, so we said this, is, this picture represents the reasonable part. We said that when you, you know, this, these, uh, this spectral information tells you, for instance, how heat diffuses in a, in a graph. That's great. Um, there's another sort of viewpoint on, on this heat flow process, which is called the random walk. Okay, so Random walk in a graph is just uh, you started some vertex and then uh, you do this random process that at every step just chooses a random neighbor. So this, you know, these are you have to take my word for it that these are random. I mean they're not, uh, but you know in some world that they were my random choices. Uh, okay, so the random walk just at every point in time we're sitting at a vertex we choose a okay a random neighbor and. Uh, you know, you can think about this as very closely related to the heat flow because if I think about heat as being carried by little particles that move around the graph, then this random walk is this trajectory of one of those little particles, right? And maybe, you know, it's sort of, uh, okay, so that's nice. Um, so what's the, what's the unreasonable part uh, of all this? Well, suppose I told you, I mean, you know, uh, suppose that sort of I felt a bit jaded by this heat flow. It's sort of, it's about the large scale behavior of, um, you know, tons of little entities moving around the graph. And I said, I want to sort of look more at like a character study. I would like to just, uh, you know, name my particle. So let's call her Sophia. Okay, that's Sophia. And, uh, and now I want to know what happens to Sophia. I want to follow Sophia around the graph. Okay. So for instance, if I, you know, here's a, here's a trajectory, Sophia. This, 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 this is a path that Sophia might take on the torus. We start her at some point and she walks around at random. Um, and you could say, okay, I, I actually, I want to know some kind of detailed information about the trajectory that Sophia takes. Okay. So this does not fit into the framework that we just discussed. In particular, physically, uh, like if you have two particles carrying heat around the graph, you know, they're completely anonymous. When they, uh, when they exist at some vertex and go off, their histories don't matter. It doesn't matter where they came from. Okay. So it's, it's sort of unreasonable that you would expect to say something about, uh, about this trajectory, I mean, really unreasonable. There's like, uh, this is sort of, this is a face palm. It's like sort of, it's, uh, it's almost embarrassing to ask the question of can you say something very precise about, you know, Sophia's, she's just one little particle of heat, her path through the graph. Okay, so okay, let me give you an example of one. Uh, of course, I said it's unreasonable, so this is, you know, you know okay, so we're gonna say something. Uh, but let me give you an example of one such parameter, okay? So um, uh, it's the cover time of the graph, okay? So the cover time of a graph is just you start this random walk. Okay, Sophia walks around the graph, and uh, and you look at how long it takes before Sophia has visited, visited every node of the graph at least once. Okay, so it's very much about Sophia's story. When has Sophia touched every uh, uh, every node? Okay, and this was studied uh, uh, back in the late 70s, uh, in particular by in, in the computer science community by Leonis Karp, Lipton, Lovas, and Rakoff. Oh, let me say by the way, the reason Karp's name is in red here is a uh, all of the long-term visitors and workshop organizers and so on to the, to the institute, I've highlighted their names in red just so you can sort of get a sense of sort of like what the kind of things people have been working on. Okay. Uh, Dick being the director gets his name highlighted as well. Uh, okay, so the cover time, here's a, here's a sort of a, a little static picture to start. So here, here's this sort of torus graph. And, uh, and the cover time, again, is going to be we run the random walk until Sophia has, has touched every, every square. Okay? 
And this is just a snapshot where we've run it for a little while, and, uh, and this number is going to represent the number of uncovered squares. OK, so here's the, here's the random one. We'll see, it'll speed up uh, after a bit, because it, although, we don't have uh, there's a protest at 5, so <laughs> we, have to, we have to get out of the room. But I mean, this is, yeah, so we're, we're tracking Sophia's progress. And, and uh, this is how many nodes are left uncovered. Okay. And then there's one more thing you'll see here, which is uh, just to get a flavor for the, the way in which this one particle, say, is imparting heat to the graph, the, uh, a square gets colored by the number of visits to that square. So you'll see some squares start to become you know, much hotter than other squares because they've been visited more. So here's the, uh, it'll speed up again, so it'll, I mean, it could take a, a bit. It's a good chance to, but I mean, it's, it's very, this is, our, this is a very simple graph, but already the way that this graph gets covered is quite complex. You know, you have these big jumps where you cover whole clusters, and then there's a, there's a while where you're not making any progress at all. And then, uh, you, know, uh, you know, and then there's this sort of last phase where you have to really collect, it's, I guess we're not so close to the last phase. You really have to collect uh, all of the remaining uh, particles. Uh, you, this torus is slightly transparent, so there, you can see there's one particle right there. That, that will not be the last, I mean, that, that's not going to be the last one. Actually, I'm not sure where the last one occurs. Uh, we're just down to seven now, though. I guess there's one there, one there. Oh, interesting. Four. It gets a little frustrating after a while. You really wish you could <laughs> jump in and help. Ah, there were two particles there. There's still one that's uncovered. Three. I know that this stops eventually, because this is actually a video and not a simulation. <laughs> uh, Okay, and then, okay, and the sad thing about this video is that okay, it stops at one uh, because uh, somehow there was a bug in my code. But okay, but wait, <laughs> no, no, but okay, there, okay, that's that was a that was a very cheap trick. I mean, I, but okay, so this is what it looks like at the end. We've covered the whole graph. It's it's down to zero. But the point I want to emphasize is that even on this very simple, this very simple graph, which has tons of symmetry and so forth, you know, the time at which you touch the last vertex is is. Okay. It looks like a very complicated function of, of Sophia's trajectory through, I don't want to say through life. I'm sure she has more to do, but at least through the torus. Um, okay, so yeah, so I've told you that it's unreasonable that we should be able to describe, for instance, this cover time, the time it takes to touch every node uh, of a graph in terms of spectral information, because it, it doesn't, you know, it's sort of, it's, it's a naive question at first, okay? But let me just remind you what spectral information we have. We have the Laplacian. We have its eigenvalues, we have its eigenvectors. Uh, and then we need, we're going to need one more thing, which is uh, just a sequence of IID normal 0, 1 random variables. Okay, so these are just n independent random variables. And then, and now we're just going to go crazy, we just consider this quantity. Okay, so what is this quantity? This is a random sum from 2 to n. Okay, the first eigenvalue is 0, so we don't want to divide by 0. It's a random sum from 2 to n. Uh, it's a, it's a, this, this thing is an n-dimensional vector because these vi's are vectors. And then these are just numbers. This is 1 over the square root of the eigenvalue, and this is our random number. So you just take this random sum of vectors uh, with some coefficients given by the eigenvalue. All right, and now suppose that you uh, took the max, this is an n-dimensional vector, vector, take the maximum entry in the vector, just the largest entry, okay, and then square it, and then multiply by the number of nodes in the graph. All right, so this is, uh, this is like one of those things where you, you teach a course and the, at the end there's some very excited, uh, overexcited student comes up and says, I wrote down this formula, do you know what it means? And you sort of like, you just can't write down s s sequences of symbols and, and hope they have some meaning. But in this case, actually, uh, this is a random quantity, okay? And uh, it turns out that this random quantity is very, very close to the cover time of the graph G. Not just for the torus, but for any graph G. Okay, this is true. Uh, so that was proved a few years ago in joint work with uh, Jian Ding and, um, and Yuval Paris. And in fact, it's, uh, it's really, really close. So in fact, the asymptotics are that as, you know, as the size of the graph goes to infinity, uh, this is a random value, okay? So, uh, but this random value uh, goes to the cover time up to some little o of one error. So very, you know, very precisely to the cover time. And so, by the way, the cover time was in, was, is a number. It's the expected number of steps. So what do I mean that this random value is close to it? Well, it turns out that this random value is also very concentrated. So if you just do an experiment 
or let's say if you want to be even safer, do this sample 10 times from this sum and take the average, it'd be a very, very good estimate of the cover time. Okay, and I should say that uh, a grad student at Stanford, Alex Jai, this year has, has really nailed down the asymptotics completely of this connection. Um, okay, so, so now I want to highlight something about this, uh, about this random sum, which is that it's sort of, and this is a, this is a key to understanding sort of the unreasonableness and, and additional unreasonable things that will happen in a second, uh, which is that it, it doesn't just concern a single eigenvalue or a sing, single eigenvector, it contains sort of holistic spectral data. Right? You know, the coefficients here contain, you know, I mean, we have all of the eigenvectors and all the eigenvalues. And actually you can see that we are weighting eigenvalues by, by sort of the, by their, by their value. So, it, you know, the, the smallest eigenvalue, right? We said that V2 is the one which controls mixing, say. Well, V2 is getting the largest weight in this random sum because we're dividing by square root of lambda 2, and lambda 2 is the smallest eigenvalue. So we are sort of favoring the bottom half of the spectrum, but we have terms here from all of the eigenvectors. Uh, okay, so this thing is, this, this random sum, this is a sort of an end, this random vector, is called the Gaussian free field, and uh, you can think about it as a sort of, it's a, uh, it's like, it's like a random surface that sits on top of your graph. Okay, so there, this, this field has all kinds of beautiful properties and connections. Uh, and what we said on the previous slide is just that if you sample from this random field, and then you look at the, 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 the highest peak of this random field, then that peak will describe to you very accurately the cover time of the graph. Okay, that's what we, that's what we said before. Um, okay, so there, you might think uh, that, uh, well, okay, we have some random process and then I have another random process and you could, you could ask if anything became simpler. But let me just say that, you know, we understand this thing very, very well, much better than we understand or at least understood before the connection cover times. So you can prove lots of things about cover times from understanding that they're related to this, this spectral data. Okay, so that's one thing. Now, another thing you might ask is, okay, you promised to prove things in, uh, like with pictures in this talk. So I would like to prove this to you with a, with, uh, with an animation, but actually proving this with an animation is a major open problem. L I mean, literally, like if you could design an animation that would convince the audience of the fact that it's true, that would be a huge deal, uh, and it would be great to see it. Uh, so instead, uh, I mean, you know, the reason this connection exists is, uh, of course, it goes back to physics, and uh, it, it deals with, it sort of has to do with combinatorics of, you know, uh, like, uh, Feynman integrals sort of like integrating over all paths the particle could take and you get some cancellations and everything works out beautifully and there's a connection. It, it is as, still as mysterious as it sounds. Um, but, let me, no, but let me say one aspect of it that's less mysterious and relates to things that other people in the program have been doing quite a bit, uh, which is sort of another physical process that has spectral implications. Okay? So this physical process is uh, uh, electrical networks. Okay? So, here, so here I have a graph. Now I want to think about the graph as an electrical network. So I'm going to think about all the edges as resistors, just say with resistance one. So I put resistors on all the edges. And then uh, we connect a battery. We, we create a, a voltage difference of say one between two nodes A and B. Okay, so I have an electrical network. Uh, I create a, a, a potential difference between A and B. And this potential difference will induce current to flow from A to B through this network. And the current, you know, what will the electrons do in the current? Well, they will, you know, they will on gen you know, in general, they will, they will try to follow some path of least resistance where the resistance is based on uh, sort of like how much the edges are resisting their flow and also how many electrons are in on a particular edge. The more they get there, the less additional electrons would like to go along that edge. Uh, but if you remember high school physics, the effective resistance between A and B is a, uh, is, uh, is the inverse of the current that we induce when we create this potential difference. Okay? And the point is that this uh, effective resistance has a spectral interpretation. So you can write the effective resistance in this way. Between two nodes A and B, if I look at, the, you know, I look at a sum divided by lambda i, this is the ith eigenvector in the coordinate A, and this is the ith eigenvector in coordinate B. Okay, so this sum is equal to the effective resistance. And you can see at least some relationship here. Okay? So, uh, you know, so one aspect that goes into this connection is, uh, deals with the fact that there is another interpretation of a physical process, these uh, electrical networks, in terms of the spectral data. Okay, uh, so let me just uh, say, uh, okay, so now I'm going to tell you a few more things about unreasonableness. 
um, that have been going on to the program. So the, the first question you might ask is, okay, you, you have all these spectral objects, you say that they're nice and they're useful, can you compute them fast? Okay, so this turns out to be the question of whether you can solve linear systems of the following form. You're given L, which is the Laplacian, and you're given B, and you want to solve the linear system Lx equals B. You want to find X. X is the unknown. Okay. I mean, by the way, this, this problem is, you know, is, so, is incredibly important. Like, uh, in, you know, essentially, it comes up in every physical simulation, you know, sort of uh, every discretization of a partial differential equation, every simulation that Boeing wants to do to figure out how wind flows over a wing, or people want to do to figure out how nanomaterials uh, uh, will act in the environment, you end up solving systems like this. They're remarkably important. And the point is that starting with work of Spielman and Tang in 2004, and then um, a sequence of works, I've just highlighted some of them, uh, Kudus Miller Pang, who really got this, the, the running time down to be very, very fast. Now, I mean, you know, now it's possible to solve these linear systems in time, which is uh, sort of, okay, so what, what matters is the number of non-zero entries in, in the Laplacian L, but uh, you can do it in time, which is faster than the time needed to sort the entries of L. Like sorting takes now longer than solving uh, these linear systems uh, from an asymptotic uh, analysis perspective. Um, okay, so that's one thing. There's a ton of work uh, there. And then, of course, I said you can do unreasonable things. So the idea that you can solve linear systems fast is, is beautiful and it's very nice and the work there is, is, uh, is remarkable, but it's not so unreasonable, okay? Uh, but the point is that uh, the answer is yes. So in particular, you can, uh, you can make progress on, on one of the oldest problems in computer science, sort of the problem of computing maximum flows and min cuts in a graph. This goes back to the, the 50s and earlier. Uh, and uh, okay, so there's a sequence of work uh, uh, some of which I've highlighted on this slide. Let me just say what the basic idea there is, which is that, uh, so uh, uh, a maximum flow is like if you, if you want to send flow between two nodes of a graph and you think about the graph as sort of a network of pipes and the flow is, you know, say, uh, oil is, sounds like a controversial thing. Let's say you want to send water. That's also controversial in California. <laughs> okay. Uh, you want to send some, uh, some fluid from A to B you know, and you're, you're, you're limited by the capacity of these pipes. So the way you sort of you can send fluid maximally from A to B, that's the maximum flow problem. And uh, uh, th so the way that these works, uh, sort of starting with this work of uh, Cristiano, Kellner, Madri, Spielman, and Tang, for instance, managed to solve maximum flows using this connection uh, to electrical networks is that, I mean, when you set up this battery here, it induces a flow of electrons from A to B, okay? That flow of electrons is not, in any way a maximum flow. In particular, it's perfectly happy to violate the capacities of the edges and so on. It's minimizing some quantity which is very different. I mean, it's, it's optimizing a quantity that's very different from what the maximum flow is. But this just, you know, but it does give you sort of a hint as to sort of like how something is flowing in the graph. And it turns out in many situations uh, in life and also in this area that uh, the hint is enough to solve the problem. Once you have a hint, like once you have a, an inkling of the right direction, uh, then you can do some kind of basically very clever gradient descent and, uh, and, solve, uh, and, s and solve the max flow problem, okay? So this is, this is unreasonable. And let me just highlight the fact that even with, with recent work of Madri, it gets even more unreasonable because uh, Madri is able to do this for directed graphs, okay? You know, the notion of electrical flow and electrical networks it's sort of fundamentally undirected, okay? I, maybe if you're clever at physics, you can come up with a directed model for a directed network. I don't know how to do it. Uh, so the fact that you can use these things to solve directed flow problems, this is very counterintuitive to me, okay? Uh, but it's true, and it, it's yet another sort of unreasonable thing that one can do with these sort of spectral data about a graph. Okay, so now in our, in our okay, we have 10 minutes left. Uh, so I wanna go to the third part, which is sort of the borders of intractability, all right? So here we were talking about sort of like a very efficient computation. You know, people in the room like uh, Gary and Giannis, when they say, you know, I think Giannis laughed at me once when I described a linear, you know, a linear system that had 100,000 variables. Because, you know, it's like things don't get interesting until you get into the millions. Uh, right, so these things can be used to solve uh, problems very, very fast, okay? And, uh, but now I want to switch perspectives and talk about sort of, uh, you know, whether problems can be solved in an efficient manner at all, okay? So, uh, okay, so, uh, so I'm going to tell you now about one problem which has had sort of holds a central place in algorithms in the past uh, uh, 10 to 15 years at least, which is the, the unique games problem, okay? 
So you're given a prime number p, and you're given a bunch of linear equations in two variables, okay, uh, over p. So I have a bunch of variables x1 to xn, and my equations are like x13 minus x7 equals 4, and okay. I have a bunch of these equations, okay. And uh, uh, now I would like to find, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to solve this system of equations if it has a solution. Uh, and in fact, the, the computational problem I want to think about is, suppose I tell you that 99% of the equations are satisfiable, okay? What that means is that there exists a setting uh, of numbers between 0 and p minus 1 to x1 up to xn, such that 99% of these equalities are satisfied, okay? So I'm telling you that the lots of them can be satisfied, almost all of them. And I just, and I say, look, you know, I know it's your first day on the job. Uh, can you find a solution that satisfies 1% of the equations? So if, if they were all simultaneously satisfiable, uh, then it's actually easy. You can use Gaussian elimination, or at least in, in this simple setting, the way I've given you these things, you know, if I give you a value for x13, there's a unique value for x7 that satisfies this equation. So you can just go around plugging things in after you just guess one value, okay? Uh, but this is the computational problem. If I, if I give you a system which is not fully satisfiable, but there's a little bit of noise, can you do even a little better than trivial? Can you get a, a, an assignment that satisfies 1% of the equations? And Cole in 2002 conjectured that this problem is not uh, easy to solve. Uh, like you will not be able to come up with an efficient algorithm to solve it. That was his conjecture. And in fact, he won the Nevin-Lena prize for many things, but actually mainly for this conjecture and its implications. This conjecture is very nice because uh, as opposed to P versus NP, which is sort of like a stark separation, this conjecture Basically, inside it has a knob where you can sort of increase the computational difficulty of a problem. And maybe you, you can hope that if, sort of, if you have such a knob and you can understand how well it affects the difficulty of a problem, then you know, this will help you to understand, for instance, what problems can be solved efficiently and not. This, you know, th that's, but this is why the disconjecture is, say, different from P versus NP, because it comes with this, this knob, and the knob appears to have a, you know, a lot of useful properties. Okay, so here's a... Here's a way you might solve this problem. Okay, right, I gave, you, I gave you this system. I promise you that it's nearly almost satisfiable. So how would you go about trying to find a solution? Here's one way, okay? You can associate a graph to this problem by, you know, if two, if two variables appear in a constraint together, you put an edge between them. Uh, and then what you do is you sort of create what's called a lift of this graph. So for every vertex in the graph, you create p copies of the vertex above it. And then if you, okay, now you want to fill in this lift, actually what you do is, you know, uh, for every value I can assign to a, something on a, one of the variables, it gives me a unique value to the other that satisfies the equation. And that determines how you put edges in this graph. You connect two things if, they, if, if those two assignments would satisfy the corresponding constraint. Um, and uh, if you think about it, for, for lack of time, let's not belabor it too much, uh, but uh, if you want to solve this, then a good way to make progress is to try to find a set in this graph uh, without too many edges crossing it. Because edges, you know, okay, um, okay, that, that sort of makes sense, except for the fact that, uh, you know, if I want my set, for instance, to correspond to an assignment uh, to, the, to these variables, then from every fiber, from every set of p variables sitting up here, I should only select one for inclusion in my set, okay? So it's really, Less, it's not so much a problem about finding a single bottleneck as it is, and maybe this is unclear, I'm not going to belabor it, as I said, because of lack of time, but this turns out to be a problem about finding lots of disjoint bottlenecks. Right? We talked about finding a single bottleneck before, and now if you want to solve this problem, one way to do it is to find lots of disjoint bottlenecks, um, uh, you know, the ni one nice thing about having disjoint bottlenecks is that the bottleneck sets have to be small, and somehow the smallness of the set corresponds that you're only allowed to select one vertex from every fiber. But let's not, let's not go into that too much right now. Let me just talk about this problem more generally. Okay, so we saw that uh, you know, the second eigenvector can help us find you know, partitions into two sets. Uh, but something that people have studied for a long time in machine learning and in vision and in image processing is, you know, suppose I wanna, I wanna break things into more sets because generally data has more than just two interesting you know, clusters in it. Okay, uh, so suppose I want to do something like this. Uh, so I'm, now I'm concerned not so much with finding a single bottleneck as finding a bunch of disjoint bottlenecks. Okay, so sort of like this is the, the new problem. And here we said that there was a, a quantitative parameter, phi star of g, that describes the worst bottleneck. In the same way you can have a, there's a quantitative parameter that you can define. I'm not going to define it. Uh, 
phi k star of g, which just says that the graph has k bottlenecks, uh, sort of k disjoint sets, each of which is a bottleneck. This is what phi k star of g is, is describing. And then if you, want, if you want to have some theoretical analysis of this connection, then what you'd want is, a, is sort of a, an, an analog, sort of a higher order analog of the Cheeger inequality we saw before. This inequality says that bottlenecks uh, relate to uh, sort of eigenvalues. And you might want something that looks like this, where you say, ah, okay, maybe having k bottlenecks relates to the, you know, having k small eigenvalues. This might be, this is a natural thing to try and do. Okay, so here's, uh, uh, here's the question. And uh, of course, it turns out that this question was asked uh, in, uh, in mathematical physics in the 70s, okay? People studying Bose-Einstein condensation. Please don't ask me what that means. Um, uh, okay, so ba basically, uh, this paper posed this problem, okay? The connection, realizing that this is the problem they were saying, was made much bit later by uh, Laurent Miquelot. Uh, and uh, so it really, and, and the question is not so much about finding what they need over here is not so much about finding disjoint bottlenecks. What they need is the ability to find small bottlenecks. Of course, if you can find many disjoint bottlenecks, one of them will be small. Okay, so it's a harder problem to find many disjoint ones. Um, well, I just let me say that this finding small bottlenecks is exactly sort of the small set expansion problem that we'll come to in the concluding uh, slide. Okay, and I should say that even in this paper, they sort of they realized, although they didn't prove it, that you shouldn't be able to get, you know this beautiful square root of two here. You have to pay something over here that depends on k. They, they suspected that to be the case in the paper and it was confirmed later that you have to pay something depending on k here. Uh, and let me just say, okay, so uh, in work with uh, uh, Cheyenne who's, uh, and, and uh, Luca, who are of course both at Simon's uh, uh, for, the, for the program, Luca is here. Uh, Luca is now a, a, a research scientist at Simon's and uh, Cheyenne uh, was here, but he's joining me soon in Seattle. Uh, we managed to prove that this is true, okay? Uh, so you can, the C of K, you can make to be K squared. And, uh, okay, and I should also say that uh, uh, Louis, Raghavendra, Tatali, and Vampala proved a related statement, which is also sufficient to resolve, uh, to resolve this conjecture, okay? So one thing I wanna say is that, uh, you know, the proof of this actually, uh, you know, is algorithmic, and the algorithm is taking a, an algorithm proposed by Ing, Jordan, and Weiss uh, about a decade ago and changing one step of it, okay? So, I mean, this, is really, this really is a problem that came from mathematical physics that people in machine learning studied, uh, and that has beautiful connections to spectral graph theory and, and spectral geometry. Uh, and even, I mean, uh, and Giannis is actually, you know, I mean, and, and uh, sort of using it, uh, uh, you can talk to him, uh, using related this and related ideas for, uh, image segmentation uh, uh, at, at the institute this year. Uh, but let me just say the one thing I wanted to, to focus on is not this, but this C of K, okay? And the reason is because if this C, if, if this C of K could be made in something that doesn't depend on K, uh, that, would, uh, that would refute this unique games conjecture, okay? Um, now you might say, okay, that's not very interesting because you told me that uh, it has to depend on K. So, okay, so why are you belaboring this? But the, well, the point is that Aurora, Barack, and Storer showed that in a certain regime, actually, you don't have to pay this dependence on K. Okay, so the regime is the following one. Uh, you give me, say, n to the point one small eigenvalues, and then I can find a set uh, which is non-trivially small, say n to the point nine nine, which is a bottleneck set, so just a small bottleneck set, and what I pay is, say, only a factor of 100. It has no dependence on has no dependence on this number of eigenvalues, okay? And the, the, the reason this is weaker than what we said before is because this sort of only holds in this regime where you have many, many, many eigenvalues. If I give you 10 eigenvalues, you can't say anything. But if I give you a very, very large number of them, then you can get rid of this dependence on K. That's what they, they proved. So, uh, okay, I, for experts, you know why this is in quotes. For the rest of us, let's ignore that it's in quotes. But basically, uh, if you could improve this bound at all, in other words, if you could do this with fewer than n to the point one eigenvalues, n to the, you know, some number which is going to zero slowly with n, then you would disprove the Unigames games conjecture, okay? Uh, okay, so that's one nice approach. You might say, there's, there's one slide left after this, we're almost done. That's, you might say that this is a, okay, this is a, you know, it's a great approach, but if the approach fails, you know, 
maybe this all this this spectral business was was nonsense. But I but it you know okay we have evidence that it's not. So for instance, um, uh, in trying to find lower bounds, so graphs that have many eigenvalues but no small many small eigenvalues but no small bottlenecks, uh, this group of uh, authors came up with something called the short code, okay? which is a very nice construction in complexity theory that has lots of implications, in like complexity theoretic implications. So the point is that you know, studying this spectral problem uh, give, you know, gives you some way of thinking about the world that has implications that we can actually prove things beyond uh, the spectral framework. Okay? So I mean, usually when this happens, it indicates that you're, you're looking at the right phenomenon. You know, sort of like uh, you, you, if, you, if, you can, if you can prove upper bounds, you get something. But also, when you think about proving lower bounds, you don't just limit this method. You end up sort of limiting all efficient computational methods in some ex ex to some extent. OK. So uh, yeah. So I mean, th this is a huge open. This, this problem is still open, whether you can improve this bound. Uh, uh, and it's incredibly interesting. All right, so this is the last slide. And the question is just, what's next? Sort of, you know, we said. Uh, there's reasonable spectral things you can do, but then if you look at this holistic spectral package, actually you can do lots of things that you wouldn't expected, have expected uh, initially. Maybe there's even a, a richer package you can look at. Okay? And as Alistair said, this richer package actually connects the two programs at the Simons Institute. Um, because computing eigenvalues and spectral information is just it's sort of one instance of, uh, of optimizing over using a semi-definite program or, or a spectrohedron. This picture is stolen from, from Baron Sternfels. This yellow thing is a picture of a three-dimensional spectrohedron that he fondly calls the Samosa. Um, uh, but the point is that you know, optimizing over such spectrohedra, we can do it efficiently. And uh, you can see these spectral methods as just one, you know, optimizing over one particular set of spectrohedra. And it turns out that there's a canonical sort of uh, increasingly complex set of spectrohedra given by what's called the sum of squares hierarchy. Okay? And uh, you know, so, so when you want to go beyond spectral methods, you can, sort of, you can pass to this more general method using semi-definite programs. And uh, we know that assuming you need a game conjecture, this sum of squares method is optimal. Okay? Sort of like, well, for, for a very wide class of problems, you know, sort of these, these algorithms based on SDPs will be the best you can do. And in, in recent work at the at actually the institute the, this semester with uh, Prasad and David, we showed actually that unconditionally, if you restrict yourself to semi-definite programs, then uh, then this 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 sort of sum of, of squares approach is optimal. Okay, so we know that you can go a little further than spectral techniques, but uh, but there is a boundary there, and we have a good idea of sort of like at least for a wide class of problems, uh, sort of like the limit of how far you can go. Okay, and of course, I mean. Understanding whether these are really the limits or whether there are better algorithms is, uh, is still one of the main research directions in this area. Okay, so that's the end. Uh, I keep saying that, but uh, this is now, you know, now the second half of this slide will be the end. If, if this was incredibly compelling to you and you're wondering, you know, okay, fine, you told me all the stories, now I'll move on with my life. Let me just say that, you know, if I had, yeah, in, in hour three of the talk, I would have told you about uh, this remarkably compelling story that starts with, Dirac in the foundations of uh, quantum computing and goes to solving linear systems and uh, to the Riemann hypothesis and then ends up in recent work of, uh, uh, done at the Institute uh, on the traveling salesman problem. Uh, so if you, uh, if you really want to know about this, you should, you should, uh, you should talk to these guys uh, who are around or, or go read their papers. But basically through a, you know, a beautiful sequence of work that starts you know, in a very abstract questions in the foundations of quantum mechanics, uh, recently, uh, at the Institute, uh, Anari and, uh, and Cheyenne were able to uh, give the first, imp you know, give, give an improvement to the asymmetric traveling salesman problem, which is sort of like one of the classical problems of combinatorial optimization. Okay, so like this is yet another example of sort of like physics and geometry and spectral techniques colliding in a completely unreasonable way. Okay, all right. So let me stop there. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so a spectrohedron is just uh, you take the cone of positive semi-definite matrices and intersect it with an, uh, a linear subspace or an affine subspace. So it it's really is just the feasible region of a semi-definite program.
you know, there are lots of semi-definite programs one can write down, though. And so it's nice that maybe there is a theory that you don't have to consider all of them. There's only a very particular kind that you need to write down to solve your problem. Does anybody know where the protests are? Sorry, getting, <laughs> go ahead. Getting, uh, where, where, where people are congregating? In Sprout, okay. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about exactly what kind of improvements you have to make that, and so the 0.1 bounds to disprove the unique injection? Yeah. You just, um, so, I mean, you'll notice, I mean, okay. Uh, you, you need to be able to do something similar with the number of eigenvalues that's uh, n to the little o of 1. So, for instance, uh, n to the little o of 1. So, say something similar where if I give you uh, 2 to the square root log n eigenvalues, uh, then you can get a sequence of sets which are getting smaller and smaller. and but which are bottlenecks, and the, and the important thing is that you, know, you get this bottleneck upper bound with something here that does not depend on the number of eigenvalues you use. Uh, 